All right, I'm really glad to be up here standing. I didn't trip on the way up. That, woo. It's also good to be here because it means I'm well and I can actually be here. It's been a rough couple of weeks, three, well, actually a month. I was supposed to do this a month ago, so we're going to be out of order. We're going back to John 14 and pick up what, what um, didn't get covered, but I know you guys, your brains are so awesome. You can just keep up with that. So it's really good to be here, and I'm going to go ahead and do a couple. I have to do my own slides today. I mean, there's just so much confusion going on up here. But I, I hope you all can see at home. I, I know my family's watching. Hi, family. <laughs> so Jesus for life. I mean, don't you just love this series? It's been so good. It's been so good to talk about Jesus, to see Jesus, to hear from Jesus every week. And I love this series for a really good reason. They, you know, there have been tough times in my life when there have been moments when God does something really special for me, something that I recognize and I know that comes from him, some sign, you know, some evidence that he has it, he sees me, he's out way ahead of me, he knows exactly what I need, exactly when I need it. And for me, this series is one of those, this Jesus for life. You know, I can still remember I was sitting, we were at lunch, and I can remember when Danielle told us that that she really felt like the year 2020 should be the year of Jesus. And I thought, whew, that's a lot of Jesus. I was really smart. I didn't say that. I, I kept that to myself. And it, you know, it didn't take very long, and I started to get really excited about it. I thought, oh my goodness, a whole year of Jesus. That would be really fun and probably life-changing. And what you have to understand is, she said this back in the good old days of the fall of 2019. You know, back when, sure, life <clears throat> it had challenges back then, but for the most part, it was really good. And I love Sundays. We'd fill this building every Sunday with children and youth and adults. And, and to one extent or another, we would experience God's truth and his love and his presence and its power. And you know what? I could hug anybody I wanted to. I could hug anybody I wanted to any time I wanted to, and I didn't have to worry that I might be inflicting great bodily harm. But I loved our Sundays. We would experience God's love through this community that really is a family. And we'd experience his presence as we just did through the worship and his truth through the teaching and his power through prayer ministry. Now, not exclusively. We experience the, those whole things all the way through, but particularly in those ways. And, and so at the time I first heard about this idea, when all those wonderful things were in place, honestly, I just thought, all right, studying Jesus for a whole year would just be icing on a really good cake. I mean, why would our Sundays ever change? This is America. And we got the best and the brightest, and surely whatever problem was thrown at us, they could solve it. And so last fall, when I first heard about this idea, it never, ever, ever occurred to me that all of that could change. But then there was COVID, and it's shocking, but everything did change. And I don't know about you, but my heart's having a hard time keeping up with all the change. And as Peggy referred, even to how long all this change might, la might last. But whenever I get too, too overwhelmed, all I have to do is stop. I just have to stop and remember that COVID didn't catch God off guard. He knew all about it. And maybe even more to the point, he knew exactly what we would need. He knew we would need a whole year of Jesus, that we would need this series, Jesus for Life, because we need to have Jesus every single week showing us how to live a life in faith, how to, how to walk out this faith in a world as uncertain as this one is. And so that does bring us to today's portion of Scripture in John 14 and this magnificent truth that Jesus loves to be with us. 
that's on the next, there it is. It's magic. And Jesus does love to be with us. I want you to just kind of take that truth in. Jesus loves to be with you. Just sit with it a minute. How do you respond? What pops up when you think about Jesus loving to be with you? I know for a lot of us that can be hard to even take in, so I want to flip it for a second and start with something way easier. Who do you love to be with? Just let a person come to mind and then ask yourself, why is it that I love to be with this person? And I know my grandson Joshua is watching right now, and I, I know he worshiped to that song, um, The Lion of Judah, because that's one of his favorite songs, and he is a person I love to be with. I was there when he was born. Every Friday, since he was about three months old, he's come to my house. You know, I know Joshua, and he knows me, and I, I love being with him. I love watching him grow and develop. I love seeing those things that are uniquely Josh. I mean, he, he has loved God passionately from a really young age, and he has this crazy gift of worship. If, in fact, we took him to Eckerd yesterday, and that was the song he was singing in the back seat. <laughs> Uh, and if he hears the song two times, he knows all the verses. I, I can't do that. Now, my age, I, if those words aren't up there, I have to hum because I can't, I can't remember them, but, but Josh can. And we also have a very special relationship. Every Friday, as I said, before kindergarten showed up and ruined everything, Josh would come to our house on Friday. <laughs> and... and when Papa would take Harrison upstairs to put him to bed, Josh would look at me and go, oh, it's Kiki and Josh time. And it was. And we had these awesome rituals. And if your parents hold your ears. But he would get two suckers and a peanut butter cup. <laughs> I know how to bribe people that want to be with me. <laughs> and so we go downstairs in the basement, and he had my undivided attention for two hours. And we play games, and we, I'm not as good at pirates as Jeff is, but I tried to impersonate a pirate. And, and we built stuff with clay, and that is really what loving to be with someone's all about. It's, it's a relationship. It's about not just spending time. I could have sat down there and not paid any attention to Josh and kind of been the caretaker, but I, I was with Josh. I was engaged with him to the point where I came to know who he was and love him for who he really is. And that's when it works best. If that relationship is reciprocal, you know, one of the reasons why I love to be with Josh is because he loves to be with me. All those suckers and peanut butter cups don't hurt. <laughs> but it always works best, if that's true, if the person you love to be with also loves to be with you. So right here at the beginning, I'm going to offer the invitation. The truth is, Jesus loves to be with you. And he wrote these verses we're about to look at in John 14 because he wants to help you love to be with him too. So we're going to just dive in. John 14, 15 and 17. If you love me, obey my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate who will never leave you. He is the Holy Spirit who leads you into all truth. The world cannot recognize him because it isn't looking for him and doesn't recognize him, but you know him, and he lives with you now and later will be in you. If you love me, obey my commandments. Now there's a showstopper for you. That's not what I would say to someone if I was trying to convince them that I love to be with them. But that's the thing about Jesus. He knows the truth is not our enemy. So he never, ever tries to hide it from us. But if you're at all struggling with what Jesus says in this verse, I think it would be good to remember what Mike Dotson said Jesus revealed to him several weeks ago. Now, this was supposed to come the next week, so you would have remembered easily, but now I'm going to have to remind you. Jesus told him he's not a tyrant. 
He, he did not come to subjugate us. Jesus came to save us. So he didn't speak these words because he was on some kind of power trip. He spoke them because he loves us and he wants to save us from our bad choices. So in the spirit of helping Jesus accomplish this end, I'm going to take a whole lot of liberty today and I'm going to add some sentences that just maybe Jesus left out of this verse. I don't know, maybe. You tell me. If you love me, then you will know me for who I truly am, and you will know that I only want what is best for you, and that I actually do know what is best for you, and then you will automatically obey my commandments. But Jesus knows us so well. He knows we could never develop this kind of love that knows him and automatically obeys him on his own. So he provides us the exact help, actually the exact helper that we need in order to succeed. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate who will never leave you. He is the Holy Spirit who leads into all truth. The world cannot, recognize, cannot receive him because it isn't looking for him and doesn't recognize him. But you know him because he lives with you now and will be, later be in you. The Greek word translated as advocate in this New Living Testament translation is Parakletos. Now, I butcher English, so I'm definitely butchering Greek. It means someone who is called in to help in times of trouble or need. Jesus is talking about the Holy Spirit. You know, other translations say counselor or comforter or helper, and the Holy Spirit is all of the above. In fact, I believe the gift of the indwelling Holy Spirit is probably one of the greatest gifts Jesus awarded to us through his death on the cross and it turns out it could only have been awarded after the cross. John 7, 37 through 39. On the last day, the climax of the festival, which was the Feast of Tabernacles, Jesus stood and shouted to the crowd, anyone who is thirsty may come to me. Anyone who believes in me may come and drink. For the scriptures declare rivers of living water will flow from his heart. And John adds, when he said living water, he was speaking of the Spirit who would be given to everyone believing in him. But the Spirit had not yet been given because Jesus had not yet entered his glory. Jesus had to pay the full price for our sin on the cross before he could even ask the Father to send the Holy Spirit to indwell us. Our debt had to be paid. Our sins had to be forgiven. And we had to receive Christ's righteousness in exchange for our sin before our bodies could become fit vessels for the Holy Spirit. You know, I think it's impossible to overestimate the value of the indwelling Holy Spirit. Jesus told Nicodemus in John 9 that without the new life that the Holy Spirit gives, you can't even see the kingdom, much less understand spiritual truths. That's why Jesus told the disciples that non-believers of this world, they don't recognize the Holy Spirit and they're not even looking for him. You know, even the disciples who had some experience of the Holy Spirit, he was with them while Jesus was on earth, would experience a huge difference once the Spirit came to live in them because then the Holy Spirit would help them understand understand everything Jesus had said and done in a way they never were able to before Pentecost. You know, that they were still pretty clueless even at the ascension, even after spending those 40 days with Jesus after the resurrection. They were still asking, when are you going to set up your kingdom on earth? But as we know, all that changed at Pentecost because the Holy Spirit came and helped them understand everything Jesus had said and done while he was on the earth. And you know what? That same Holy Spirit lives in me, lives in you, lives in everyone the moment they receive Jesus as their Lord and Savior. And that's really good. But as if that gift of the Holy Spirit wasn't enough, Jesus offers them even more. He offers them himself. Oh, dry mouth. No, I will not abandon you as orphans. I will come to you. 
Soon the world will no longer see me, but you will see me. Since I live, you will also live. When I am raised to life again, you will know that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Those who accept my commandments and obey them are the ones who love me. And because they love me, my Father will love them, and I will love them, and reveal myself to each of them. Judas, not Judas Iscariot, but the other disciple with that name said to him, Lord, why are you going to reveal yourself only to us and not to the world at large? Jesus replied, all who love me will do what I say. My Father will love them, and we will come and make our home with each of them. Anyone who does not love me will not obey me. And remember, my words are not my own. What I am telling you is from the Father who sent me. You know, in the first few verses of this, Jesus is actually obviously speaking to his disciples alone. And he tells them that he is going to come back for them after his resurrection. And then he encourages them with this wonderful news that they will see things much more clearly once they receive spiritual life. And that all makes perfect sense and seems perfectly clear to me. But then it changes in verse 21. And Jesus switches gears. And he stops talking specifically to the disciples in their current context. And instead he addresses everyone who will ever believe in Jesus in the future. John 14, 21. Those who accept my commandments and obey them are the ones who love me. And because they love me, my Father will love them, and I will love them and reveal myself to each of them. The truth in this verse has transformed my life, and I believe it will transform yours if you let it. You know, I think there are times that we read Scripture and we just kind of slide right over what Jesus is saying, and then we miss what Jesus is offering to us. And for my money, this is one of those verses. You know, the Greek word translated in this New Living Testament as, I will reveal myself to each of them is emphanizo. It means to exhibit or appear in person. In other translations of the Bible, the words manifest or disclose or make myself plain or show myself to them are used to translate this word. But that all means Jesus wants to show himself to us personally. You know, and it's shocking to me now, but for years of my Christian walk, 25 of them, I used to read this verse and never ever wonder or ever think what Jesus meant by it. I never even asked him. You know, I taught John 14 in the late 90s when I was the teaching director of a large non-denominational Bible study. So I went back and read what I said when I taught it. I skipped right over it. I didn't even mention it. I think I thought it belonged to the disciples and it didn't have any impact on me and I went right over it. But oh my goodness, I was wrong. I was so wrong. Jesus is not talking just to the disciples in this verse. He says himself, he is actually talking to everyone who obeys his commandments. Why? Because they love him. I believe that means he's talking to everyone who desires to know Jesus intimately and personally. You know, for a whole lot of, of my Christian walk, the cry of my heart was, and still is to a certain extent, Jesus, I want to appropriate everything in my life that you died on the cross to gain for me. And during those years, I experienced a lot of healing. And day by day, bit by bit, I developed a relationship with God that I thought was really intimate and good. And, you know, others thought I had too. I can remember being at a women's retreat, one of our church's women's retreat, and Shanty Grant said God had given her a word for me. And she prefaced it by saying, you know, I feel kind of funny even telling you this because I know how close you are to God. But then she just looked me straight in the face and she said, I want you to know that no matter how much you have experienced, 
No matter how much God has done in you or through you or for you, there's more. God has more for you. Martha was there when she said that. And of course, I was blessed and I was encouraged by those words, but I was clueless. I thought, good heavens, what could be more? I didn't know when it would happen. I didn't know how it would happen, and I didn't know what it meant. And it stayed that way for a really long time. It stayed that way into the fall of 2015 when I was first introduced to what I now call the miracle of Emmanuel prayer. For those who you don't know, and there's probably not many who don't know, Emmanuel prayer is a prayer experience where G the Holy Spirit manifests Jesus to your sanctified imagination in such a way that you can see Jesus and you can interact with him. And throughout the last five years, I have watched Jesus manifest himself, reveal himself, interact with everyone who wants to see him. But I found out that really is the kicker. You have to want to see Jesus. You know, when I was first uh, introduced to Emmanuel Prayer, I did receive once, and in that I felt like Jesus showed me that he wants to be next to me in my basement doing my work for me. And I thought, whoo, awesome, because I was mentoring a lot of women, and, and it, was, it was not easy. It was slow business, and, you know, I, my cry of my heart, the desire of my heart was to help them heal so that they could become the people God designed them to be. But it was slow going, it, was, it could be exhilarating, but it could also be really frustrating and time consuming. And so to see that Jesus wanted to do this work for me, ooh, I was delighted. And believe it or not, for that first year, I didn't even receive a manual prayer. I thought it was a tool that I could use to get Jesus to do my work for me. And I'm telling you, he was really good. First title he's given in Isaiah is Wonderful Counselor. And he is a wonderful counselor. And he was so, 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 so much better at it than I was. And then in the fall of 2016, I met Pasty, Pastor Patty Valletta, and my life changed. She's become my mentor. And she made me realize that Emmanuel prayer is not simply a tool to get Jesus to do my work for me. Although, man, he did do my work for me. She said, no, it, Emmanuel prayer is a lifestyle. It's a way of living. It's a way of abiding with Jesus and always being aware of his presence and being able to receive from him. In her words, it's the best way to develop intimacy with Jesus. And she said, healing's not the goal. Healing is the means. It is how we become more intimately connected with Jesus, but it's not the end. And then she looked at me and she point blank said, if you're going to be coaching people on manual prayer, then you need to be receiving it on a regular basis so that your own intimacy with Jesus increases. And I was, I was freaked out. I thought, whoa. And then she went even further and she said, hey, let, let, let me do a demonstration with you. I will coach you at this seminar for everybody to watch and see and Jesus can show up for you and interact with you, and I was scared to death. And, you know, thinking about that, I realized I was afraid. I was afraid to be with Jesus, to see him and to hear what he might have to say to me because I knew Jesus knew me. I knew he knew everything that I've ever done, what I continue to do and say and think and all those choices I make. In my heart of hearts, I was sure Jesus was going to be angry or at the very least disappointed in me. But I'm telling you, I was so wrong. I've been receiving a manual prayer now for uh, four years, almost on a weekly basis. And I can tell you, every time I've received, he has revealed himself to me. And every time he has revealed himself to me, he has bent over backwards to let me know he loves me. He, he uses humor. I mean, he, there's no limit he's not willing to go to to convince my heart that Jesus delights in me, that he sees me and he knows me, and still he loves me with all of his heart. And through Emmanuel prayer, he's convinced me. He's actually shown me 
that he's willing to do everything in his power to remove all those things from my past that still have a hold on me and prevent me from loving him or others in the present. You know, I don't think any of us have reached adulthood unscathed. I know I didn't. We've all had experiences where we were hurt or teased or embarrassed or shamed or even worse, abused in some way. And as a result, we took in lies about ourselves that feel very, very true. And, it, and then we developed coping mechanisms and ways to protect ourselves and pain management plans that feel so necessary to us as adults. And these are the very things that keep us from living the abundant life that Jesus died to gain for us. But Jesus knows. And Jesus cares. And I can testify that Jesus can go back to every single place those lies came in. And he can set you free. He can set you free from their impact. And he can set you free to love him and to receive love from him and to love others. You know, I know you might, your head might be spinning and that this is a lot to take in if you've never heard about a manual prayer before today. And maybe you're just not comfortable accepting this idea that Jesus wants you to see him based on my testimony alone. Well, good news is you don't have to. There are lots of people in this church that have received a manual prayer, have had the same exact experience I have, and I know any one of them would love to share it with you. But maybe you feel this is just too important to just trust the testimony of other people who say to you that it's true. I get that. And if that's the case, I want you just to consider this. What kind of person is Jesus? Is Jesus someone who says what he means and means what he says? Does Jesus always tell us the truth? When he said in verse 21 that he would reveal himself to each of us, and remember in the original Greek that means in person, did he mean it? But even Jesus knew this would be hard for us to take in. It's, it's hard to believe and understand that we can see Jesus this side of heaven and we can interact with him. He knew that would be hard. And so he throws out his trump card in verse 24. And remember, my words are not my own. What I am telling you is from the Father who sent me. You know, I believe it is the Father. It was his idea. It was his design. Because he wants every single one of us to abide with Jesus, to know that kind of intimacy. If you're still having a hard time taking all this in and believing it, I will be delighted to talk to you. But maybe before you do that, it's an even better idea to talk to Jesus and the Father and ask them whether it's true. And so it's time to move on. We're going to look at the last section of John 14 where he's, he goes back to addressing his disciples and preparing them for what was coming. But even in these verses, Jesus has a really special gift for all of us today. I am telling you these things while I'm still with you, but when the Father sends the Advocate as my representative, that is the Holy Spirit, he will teach you everything I've told you. I am leaving you with a gift, peace of mind and heart. And the peace I give is a gift the world cannot give, so don't be troubled or afraid what David prayed for. And remember what I told you. I am going away, but I will come back to you again. If you really love me, you'd be happy that I'm going to the Father, who is greater than I am. I've told you these things before they happen, so that when they do happen, 
you will believe. I don't have much more time to talk to you because the ruler of this world approaches. He has no power over me. And here's why. But I will do what the Father requires of me so that the world will know that I love the Father. Come, let's be going. You know, there's obviously a lot we could talk about in these verses, but I don't have a lot of time left to talk to you guys either. So I'm just going to focus on verse 27. Oh yeah, so I'll show you. I am leaving you with a gift, peace of mind and heart. The peace I give is a gift the world cannot give, so don't be troubled or afraid. And I want to remind you of what Jesus said right after this. Remember what I told you. I am going away, but I will come back to you again. You know, this peace that Jesus is talking about here is a peace that believers can't even understand. Because as Paul says in Philippians, it is a peace that surpasses understanding. And it's not just theological or theoretical, it's a tangible peace. It's a peace that involves your body, your soul, and your spirit. And it's a peace that Jesus can give to us in the midst of really troubling uh, circumstances. And he can do it because it's not tied to the circumstances. It's tied to Jesus and to his presence. And I know it firsthand. You know, it's been quite a while ago now. It wasn't so long ago when I first was going to teach this, but quite a while ago I had a conversation with someone I really care about, and it didn't go well. And even as I was having the conversation, I knew it wasn't going well, but I had no idea how to save it. And so when I, after I hung up and I got off the phone, this horrible anxiety and fear took up residence in my stomach. I knew I'd blown it, and I felt terrible about it. And so I called a friend, and they were very supportive, and, and that helped. It dissipated a little bit. But then later that night, when I was sitting up all by myself, because Jeff had gone to bed, not that I'm mad at him for going to bed. That's what he does. He goes to bed. And I was sitting up, and all that fear and anxiety came roaring back. I mean, it was physical, and I was really worried that I wasn't going to be able to go to sleep. And I knew I needed some real help. And so out loud, sitting in my family room, not too out loud, because I didn't want to wake him up. His bedroom's on the first floor, our bedroom. And, and I just said to Jesus, you know, okay, Jesus, I'm really worried about this anxiety in my stomach that it's going to keep me from going to sleep and I'm going to try and find you in the room and I'm going to ask you to take it away but I'm not really convinced you can and so if if you don't I just want you to know up front that I'm going to take a Valium and then I'm going to try and get some sleep and hopefully that will work so it was with that great amount of faith <laughs> that I asked Jesus to give me a positive memory and he did. And I closed my eyes and I took some time reconnecting with that positive memory and reconnecting with how it felt. And then out loud, I told Jesus what I appreciated about him because of what I experienced in that memory. And then with my eyes closed, I just said, okay, Jesus, show me where you are right now with me in this room. And pretty quickly, I saw him standing right in front of me and he had this huge grin on his face. I mean, I think he was really happy that I actually thought he might be able to do it. And I turned to him. And I'm telling you, I never even got the chance to ask him to take away the anxiety because it left the moment I saw him. And it didn't come back. And I went, fell asleep. And I slept like a baby, even better than a baby, because I didn't wake up the whole night. And I'm telling you, it was real, and it was good, and it was loving. And so would the worship team come up? You know, today, because of how I have experienced Jesus and interacted with him and seen his love for me and the power of that love in my life, I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that Jesus loves to be with me. But I also know we're all unique and that Jesus is very creative 
And so there's lots of ways he can show you that he loves to be with you. And, and that is the invitation of how to move yourself toward Jesus this week. Spend some time with him and just ask him, Jesus, show me, show me that you love to be with me. And then we always want to be moving other people towards Jesus. So just go ahead and tell someone. Tell someone that Jesus loves to be with them. And then share with them how Jesus has shown you that truth in your own life.